Good morning, everyone. There's the bell, so it's time for us to begin. Thank you for being here this morning. Appreciate you being here and being part of this class. Uh, as you know, this is Excellence in Praise and Worship. This is Lesson 1.3. Uh, I missed the first two lessons. We were out of town, um, but I'm glad to be back. Thanks to Jim for uh, taking those first two classes for me. I appreciate that. So good to see everybody this morning. Before we get into class, uh, a little housekeeping question. How many people do not have a copy of the book? Could you raise your hands, please? Okay, so <laughs> as Jim said, I think some people are eating them. We printed 120, um, and we're, we're out, which is surprising. So uh, I will get some more ordered, um, and we'll have those. It'll probably take about 10 days. That's what it took with the first printing. So, you know, probably by middle of next week, uh, we can have some new ones in. So uh, sorry if you don't have a copy yet. Uh, if you want, you can reach out to me. I can send you the PDF version. I've got that available so you can at least look at the lessons and be prepared before class begins. Uh, Jim covered an introduction in his first class a week ago today. Uh, I'm not going to retread all that. I'm just going to do just say a few brief remarks. Um, when, if you're like me, when, you got, when the topic got brought up that we're going to do a quarter of studying worship, you thought, how in the world are you going to do a quarter of studying worship? That seems like you're going to beat a dead horse, revive it, and then beat it again. Um, but as we went through this study and prepared this material, uh, found out there's a lot uh, about worship in Scripture. That shouldn't be that surprising, I guess, really, right? It's something that bonds us across the dispensations from the patriarchal age to the mosaic age to this age, we are all worshiping God, and we all have some things in common when we do that. So uh, in, a, in a very real way, this connects us back to our spiritual ancestors, and that's amazing, and it should be a really interesting thing. And there's an awful lot of value in just thinking about something more than what we read, we, we, say, we read scripture, we pray, we take the Lord's Supper, we sing, we hear a sermon, and therefore we have worshipped. No, no, I mean, we're, we're going to look at today that you may do all of those things and never worship uh, because of where your heart is and where your head is. So that's, I hope, the value in doing an entire quarter of this study uh, as Jim and I uh, kind of lead through this. I hope you'll see that same thing that we saw as we prepared this class. So again, thank you all for being here. If you've got questions this morning, if it's a brief comment or question, go ahead and shout it out. Uh, if you need the microphone, just raise your hand up. Matt will run a mic. I think you're running mics. Matt's got one. I've got the lapel mic. I'll uh, do what Sean does and just kind of run over and, and play Phil Donahue. There are so many people in this room who don't know who Phil Donahue is. <laughs> That's not good for me. But anyway, but we'll, we'll definitely get your comment uh, recorded. And if, not, if it's a short one, I'll try to just repeat it for the sake of the recording. All right, before we go into our study, let's have a word of prayer together, please. Our Holy Father, we thank you so much for the blessing of life that we have every day, that we woke up this morning with an opportunity on the first day of the week to gather together as a congregation of your people to offer you our praise and our worship. And as we study this morning and as the classes in the back uh, begin this morning, we pray that we're all digging deep into your word, challenging ourselves, uh, throwing aside our biases as much as we possibly can and asking what you have to tell us so that we can learn who you are, we can learn what you have done, we can find the worth in praising you and worshiping you from the bottom of our hearts, giving you all of our best. And we pray this what we do this quarter, we pray this what we do every day. But Father, we thank you for the love that you give to us through your Son, and we pray in his holy name. Amen. All right, so... As we begin this morning, I want to take a look. What we're going to talk about this morning is being prepared. What does it mean to be prepared? Uh, and we'll talk about several different things. Uh, we'll talk about distraction. We'll talk about preparation. We'll talk about your thoughts, your heart. Um, but I want to begin with a bit of a warning. So if you would, let's look at Ephesians. Or Ephesians. No, let's not look at Ephesians. Ecclesiastes, the other E book. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And let's read these first seven verses. It says, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. 
To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know what they are do- that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, but God is the one you must fear. So the warning in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, 1 through 7, is be careful how you go into God's presence. Aren't we always in God's presence? I mean, yeah, we are, right? We're always in God's presence. God is omnipresent. He is always around us he's always part of what we do but this is different for what Solomon was talking about he was talking about going into the temple Uh, but we don't do that now we don't go into the temple anymore now we are the temple so is worship somehow different is it somehow different going into God's presence when we worship or when we pray than it is just living life what do you think is it different somehow I see some nods So, yeah, I agree. It is somehow different when we come into God's presence. Look at some of the things that Solomon has to say here. He says, be not rash with your mouth. Don't let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. There needs to be this recognition of who we are. Now, you are amazing and I mean that individually. You all are. You're all amazing because you're made in God's image and that means something. And God was willing to send his son to die for you, and that gives you value. But you are not God. You are not on his plane. So we must recognize when we come into his presence that we must come with some reverence, with some respect of who he is. Look backwards at, the, at verse 1 here in chapter 5. Solomon says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. But listen to this sentence. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. You think you've ever offered the sacrifice of a fool? I have. I will be the first to admit that I have stood before a congregation and I have said things that I want to sound good. Because I want you all to be impressed. That is not a good thing. My heart is in the wrong place if that's what I'm doing. But I think a lot of us have done that. You know, men who've led public prayer, and and I can say this with confidence, most of us, I think, have worried about how we're going to sound to you all. That's That's a really nervy sort of thing, to stand in front of a group and lead them in prayer. You're talking to God. You're talking on behalf of these people. You're representing the people to God. You don't want to sound like an idiot. You don't want to sound like a rube. You want to try to use... I think that's why a lot of men, and I'm not knocking you if you do this, pray in the King James English, right? We don't ever walk around saying thee and thou and thus. We don't speak that way. But when we're talking to God, we do that because we're trying to dial into a sense of reverence. We're trying to sound a little bit more religious, a little bit more spiritual. We want it to be different because it is different. But afraid that sometimes when we do that, we leave our hearts out of it. And we leave meaning out of it because we're just trying to, to play the part. And what I think Solomon is warning about there is don't run in there so eager to say something, so eager to impress, that you forget what you are doing. It is better that you enter into worship and take your dear sweet time, have long pauses, than to say something that means nothing. Or worse, to say something wrong. Because you're just trying to impress. So he says, be careful not to offer the sacrifice of fools. And so that's one thing. That's one thing we talk about. When you talk about being careful, how you go into worship, that's something you have to consider. Is what are you doing it for? And there's more to say about that later. 
But there's also something else. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time here. In Isaiah chapter 1, and beginning in verse 11... Actually, we're going, to, we're going to fall back into verse 9 to begin, and we'll read down through verse 20. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts, I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feast my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So here is a question. When we're talking about this, um, this, oh, I forgot this slide. This is what happens. I should have brought both podiums so I could have all my notes up here. It is a big deal to come into God's presence. Whether you say it like this, it's a ponderous thing. This is where the, somebody said, they said you know, <laughs> that I use a lot of big words. No, I use thesaurus.com a lot. Ponderous is one of those words that comes from thesaurus.com. I don't, I don't use the word ponderous. This is me trying to sound smart, doing the exact thing I just told you not to do. <laughs> But it is a big deal. It is a grave and solemn thing to go into the presence of God. And so when Judah came in to worship, when Isaiah is talking to them, oh, I always hate when I mess my slides up. They come in, what are they doing? Are they doing things right? Are they doing things wrong? And before you answer that question, I'll let you think about it, because LR has a comment. I was thinking about a time that I had a conversation when Kevin Morrill was an elder here years ago. And Kevin uh, pointed out, he said, when we have a prayer or something we're doing in service, we call it the opening prayer. It needs to be a prayer about the service, mm-hmm. about God, and, and we're, we're worshiping you, and, and here's what we're doing. The purpose of the opening prayer is we're opening a, a religious service. A closing prayer is we're closing religious service and asking for God's favor until we meet again. And it, we, we need to keep our purpose of the prayer in mind when we pray. And I thought that was very good uh, words of wisdom from him. Uh, years before, many, many years before, I'd been in another congregation. And the opening prayer, man, took 35 minutes for the opening prayer. And he went everywhere in that prayer. Every, and it's, the things he prayed for was not wrong, but it was not part of an opening prayer. It was not about the right. service. And, and he lost total focus on that. And it wore out the congregation. Mm-hmm. And it kind of took him off the track of worship that day. Yeah, that's a good comment and, and an excellent point that, that Kevin made all those years ago that um, it's a matter of keeping focus on what you're trying to do whenever you offer this prayer. What are you doing? Are you trying to, you, know, you could go any number of places in a prayer you know, you're, when you're speaking to God, uh, you know, whether it be supplication or praise or confession or whatever. But if you're opening worship, that's very specific. And so your prayer should be rather specific. It's not to say that you can't mention other things. But you do want to, do you have a comment, Dwight? When we're praying, we need to remember we're talking to God or for him, to the congregation. Mm-hmm. And we need to be careful of our words. And what LR said is the appropriate prayer is at the appropriate time. Yes. You need to remember what you're praying for and when. So that's my comment on, on prayer, the, 
the thing needs to be done right, whatever we do. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. Um, and that, that sort of goes along with what Solomon was saying, right? Don't be so hasty. Don't be so fast. Don't be so rash. Take your time and think about what you're doing and be focused. And he gives the, he gives the advice to let your words be few. Don't get up there and just go and go and go and go. Think about what you're saying. Let each word have purpose uh, whenever you speak before the congregation. So back in Isaiah, when we talk about Judah, what are some of the things that they are doing right in their worship? What are they doing? They're offering sacrifices, and that's a good thing. Their sacrifices are commanded. So they're following God's law and offering sacrifices. What else are they doing? They're burning incense. So again, that's not a bad thing. They're burning incense. That's a good thing that they're doing. Um, what are some of the things that they are keeping or observing? They're not forsaking the assembly. They're coming together like they're supposed to on the Sabbath day for them, on the first day of the week for us. They're keeping all the festivals, the new moons, the feasts, and all those uh, different different. Um, festivals and observances that they are commanded to keep. One more thing that they do, that we do, give you a clue, with the prayer hands. They're praying, right? They're praying. What, what of those things are wrong? I mean, this is all technically proper, right? These are all things that they ought to be doing. And so they are. Yet, it's very clear that God is not happy with their worship. Why not? Why is God unhappy with their worship? And since I didn't do this slide properly, you can just look up there and, and you can see the words that God offers, right? He said, I've had enough. I do not delight in the things you're doing. You trample my courts. You have vain offerings. Your worship's an abomination. My soul hates what you do. Can you imagine um, how that felt? In verse 11, it says, to what purpose? Yeah, in verse 11, uh, Jim says, to what purpose? Why are you even doing this? Can you imagine if we left the assembly this morning and as, as we word our closing prayer, an appropriate closing prayer, saying the right things, and God said, stop. I don't like anything you've done this morning. My soul hates everything you've offered me. While you think about that, uh, Dwight's going to comment. Let me add to what I said, that when you pray, it doesn't want to be memorized. You need to think ahead of what you're going to say and if it's appropriate at that time. Yeah, very good. Yeah, very good. It doesn't have to be something that you memorize, something you do rote, because you, don't, you want your heart to be in it. But at the same time, you need to think about it, think ahead of time. Is it worth saying? Does it add value? Is it something God needs to hear from us? Is it pleasing to God? Is it pleasing to God? Number one thing. You're praying for the entire congregation. Right. That's what it's all about. For everyone that's listening, you're praying for him, to God. Yes. And there's a, again, there's a million different things you can pray about that are good. There's different ways you can pray. Uh, one of the things somebody suggested to me about a year ago, a lady I work with, asked, she said, she said, have you ever prayed Acts? And I'm like, prayed the book of Acts? I don't understand what that even means. And she said, no, no, you pray adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication in that order. That's a pretty, pretty cool idea. That would be a lousy opening prayer because that's not what opening prayer should be. But, that's a, but there's a lot of different ways, a lot of mnemonic devices or whatever that you can use to pray, and they can be perfectly appropriate at the proper time. So Judah's worship is technically proficient. It looks the part, right? When they left the congregation, they probably felt good about it. So what's the problem? What does God tell them the problem is? Yeah, so 
Matt, you're too slow, and I was too. We didn't catch it on, on microphone. <laughs> but, but what Todd said is this is a perfect example of being legalistic. Man, now that bites a little bit because if, if as members of the church, if we're ever guilty of erring, we tend to err on the side of legalism because we want to make sure we get it doctrinally correct. And that is a good, it's a good thing to make sure you're doctrinally correct. Please do not ever understand me to say anything different than that. Um, but there was a problem with what they did when it was doctrinally correct. And what God said is, your hands are full of blood. He said, what you are doing is not good to me, not because of what you're doing, not because of how you're doing it, but because of you. It's the people who are offering this who are not sufficient in some way. To me, to me, Travis, verse 16 is so important. He says, wash your hands. Make sure you're clean before you approach me. Make sure the words are true to what I want you to say. So that, that's, to me, very important. you got to be clean before you approach the throne. Yes, and that, that's a perfect segue, Dwight. So when, when he says your hands need to be clean, we're not just talking about ritualistic cleansing here. There is something that they have to do. He tells them, uh, beginning in verse 16, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil deeds from before my eyes. They're doing evil, right? He says, cease to do evil. Learn to do good. What good? And he tells them, seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. All of those things are things that we can do today in the Lord's church. And we better, or we'll be guilty of the same thing Judah was guilty of. Come on. You know, Mark chapter 11, uh, Jesus cleanses the temple. Technically, they were doing everything right, but he cleanses the temple. Let's say, uh, he says, you made it a den of thieves. And it's not about the, t yeah, the technicality is important, but it's about the heart. Right. And again, it, it, the Pharisees are questioning about your, your disciples doing a wash and cleanse and, and wash the, and he's talking about doing things from the heart. Are we doing things from the heart while we're doing the things that are technically correct? And not only are we doing things from the heart, but how is our heart? It wasn't what they were doing when they assembled at the sa on the Sabbath. It's what they were doing Sunday through Friday night. That's what was making them impure. It wasn't the acts of worship. Those were fine. It was the lives that they lived. Their hearts were evil. Their hearts were black. It's the same lesson that Jesus has in Matthew chapter 5, in verses 23 and 24, there, Jesus, in the middle of talking about anger, says, um, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. <coughs> Why? Why is that so important? Is, is God saying in Isaiah, and here in Matthew, through Jesus, is God saying that worship is secondary to relationships? Yes or no? Is that what God is saying? God is saying your relationships are more important than worshiping? No, absolutely not. But are they important? I'll get you just a second, Dwight. They are connected. Yes, that's right. They absolutely are connected. Thank you, Brad. Because religion's not what we do when we are assembled. It is who we are. Christians, it's who we are. It, when we compartmentalize and think that this is what we are on Sunday, and therefore Monday through Tuesday we're different, we get a boost on Wednesday, we come back. No. Every day of your life you are saved from your sins. Therefore, every day of your life you owe a debt to God. And you ought to live that way. Dwight. I don't think you can go wrong. When you take any excerpt from John 17, the Lord's Prayer. Yes, sir. Because he's praying for everybody to his Father. And the acts of worship have to be pure, complete, and well thought out. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can go wrong in John 17. I agree. Taking excerpts from that prayer. John's my favorite book. John 17 may be my favorite chapter in that book. The high priestly prayer is loaded with good stuff. All right, so... 
we cannot come into God's presence impure. That's what he said to Isaiah. I cannot endure your um, iniquity and your assembly. You can't do both of those things. You have to be cleansed. So it is a matter of preparation in that way because we have to make sure that we live the right kind of lives, that we love people. All of these creation, all, this beautiful, all these beautiful people that we're surrounded with are all created in God's image. We must love them. And not just in word, but in deed. We have to be real. And then we can come and offer God worship. Then he will receive it. Okay. I need to speed up just a lot. Okay. <laughs> Num- number two. Yes, Brad. congregation and we utter a prayer well we could get anybody on the street we could go up on the hill and get someone who knows the scriptures inside and out but doesn't believe them they can leave you know we could write out a rote a, a rote prayer they can say that and it can be perfectly it can sound fine to our ears but what that looks like in our lives is is when we stand before the best preparation and we should think about what we're saying and what we're doing but the best preparation for that is doing it you can tell when a man stands in the pulpit and prays you can tell if he is a man who prays at home Mm -hmm. on a daily basis you can tell that i'm sorry to break that news to you but it shows it really does and 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 so when we think about those kinds of things we have to make that's why those things are connected we have to make sure that that relationship, our relationship with God, is correct, is right, and we're doing what he says. Then, uh, that, that's our preparation. We may not have the best speech. You know, I don't have the best English, but I can still say a prayer that's, that's acceptable to God, and I can lead the congregation in a prayer that's acceptable to God. Right. If I've done what I should do, what I'm supposed to be doing. Yes, get your heart God. right, pray, to, pray a sincere prayer lead sincere singing, all those things, and that will be pleasing to God. There are people I do not doubt when they heard Isaiah prophesy that in chapter 1 were shocked to hear that God was upset, just like we would be. All right, Dwight. I believe that our first thought before prayer is to remember who you're praying to the God of the universe, the all-powerful, the always present. He is the one that judges what you're praying. Is it from the heart or is it not? Right. It has to be that way. There can be no exceptions. Agree. And that, again, that's another great segue. I did not pay Dwight to do this. He just happens to be that talented. Uh, but that leads into this next thought. Thought number two is remember the audience of one. I want to give credit to Stephen because he remembered the sermon and I went back and listened to it. But... Back in September of 2016, Terry Slack held a gospel meeting here, and he did a sermon called An Audience of One. I recommend that you listen to it. It's terrific, and it really speaks to what we're talking about here. What, who are we worshiping? We are worshiping God. Worship is for God. It is to God. It is explained by God. Our audience is God primarily. Do we all hear it? Sure. Do we all participate? We better. But it's for God, and we've got to bear that in mind. Look at Revelation 4, 8. It's up on the screen. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings and full of eyes all around and within, and day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That is who we worship when we assemble. That's who it is. And if we think it's about the, the audience in front of us, then we really have to do some, in, some personal thought and some inspection. Um, Dwight, I can't. I've got to keep moving. That's me. Uh, okay. I feel like I'm talking too much. But uh, when you're praying, you're praying for the, to God for the entire congregation. Mm-hmm. And wouldn't it be a funny thing for everybody to pray at once? It would be sad. It would be sad because nothing would make any sense. So you've got to think before you talk, and you've got to talk what you think. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's got to be pure and 
unwholesome and, and pleasing to him. And that's our first thought before we pray. Yeah, and that's a big responsibility. Um, we have to think of it that way. And, you know, we've really talked a lot about prayer, but this has the same thing to do if you were teaching a lesson, if you were giving an invitation, if you were leading singing. Even if you're reading scripture, you're reading in worship to God. So, you know, we, we each develop our skills in those things. Um, I'm going to say something that's going to sound a little weird, but give me a moment. When you do those things, there's a performance aspect to that. Don't freak out. <laughs> what I mean is when you read scripture, the punctuation is there for a reason. Uh, and it's something that, you know, we, we try to teach, I try to teach my son, and some of you try to teach your kids, is don't just read scripture like this with one note all the time and everything is monotone, because that's not how it's written. I will never forget the first time I heard David Lanfear talk about the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, and David pointed out that it probably wasn't just a whispered prayer. That God probably spoke, or that Jesus probably spoke really loudly, Lord, if it is your will, take this cup from me. And what I mean, so that's what I mean by performance, is understanding what you're reading and reading with that inflection and that punctuation because it is important. And so there is something to that for sure. All right, um, back in Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 7 there. Solomon's, uh, his advice there is to guard your steps, be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. And again, as we've mentioned, that be mindful of your audience, that primarily it is God. Does worship benefit us? Yes or no? You think worship benefits us? Yeah, of course it does. Does it benefit the person who's leading worship? Yeah, is that okay? Sure, sure. The point, but the point is, is to remember who it's for. It's a beautiful thing that God has designed worship in a way that benefits us. But it's not about us. Jim. there and, and do some talking yeah but to to be an effectual prayer i think we have to know god and god says you don't you don't know me that's the issue here that's the problem yeah this sort of peeks ahead to lesson four on wednesday so shameless plug lesson four that's okay it, it's we're going to get there on wednesday so we may as well talk a little bit about it now worship is for christians this is what we do and there's a very real sense in which people who are not Christians, although they may come and they may play the parts, are not fellowshipping with us in worship. To worship God, we must know God. To know God, we must know Christ, because that is our conduit to God. So yeah, that's very important. And again, like Brad said, you can say all the pretty words you want to. Like Jim said, you have to know God to speak to God for God's people. It's a very real thing. I can't, Dwight. I want to, but I just can't. <laughs> Um, again, worship is of God, for God, it is to God. Um, yeah, sorry, I had to reread my notes and gotten a little thrown off there. Um, the thought is focus, right? It's about focus. Um, it is, again, it's not wrong for you to say something and not want to sound stupid if you're speaking in front of people. That's natural, okay? And it's not wrong for you to try to sound, you know, a little a grade above what your education is. I understand why you would do that. But your focus is God. If you stand before and you lead, and again, we'll talk about prayer, but let's just say you're giving an invitation, gentlemen, or uh, if, you're, if you're at home and you're doing some sort of devotional with your family, for me to feel it from your heart means a whole lot more than for me to be impressed with your mind. And I think God feels the same way. He just wants to know that there is sincerity in what we do. Again, it matters what we do, but sincerity is so important. All right, last section at warp speed. Uh, be prepared. In Leviticus chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, it'll, it'll be up on the screen. Uh, on the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, and he said to Aaron, take for yourself a bull calf, for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, born without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. Quick question, how long did it take?
to consecrate these priests, these Levitical priests. Hint, it is in the reading. Eight days. Eight days. At least, because you had to have a burnt calf, you need to have a, you need to have a ram without blemish. You had to get those prepared. But it was at least eight days of a process to get these Levitical priests com, uh, consecrated. Last week, last Sunday, Jim said, you know, when's the right, how much time is the right amount of time to spend preparing for this lesson? Well, he said, there's no right or wrong answer. I'm going to disagree slightly. There's a wrong answer because he sort of said it. If you start preparing for a lesson at 8 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, that's the wrong time. You didn't give it enough time. Now, some of us will spend hours. Some of us will spend 45 minutes. I'm not telling you one's right, one, more right than the other, but I'll tell you this. If all the thought we give to worship begins at 10 a.m. this morning, that's not good enough. That is stepping all over my own toes. We have three kids, one of which is now four, and it, you'd think that we just you give her Red Bull constantly. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> and we have to come here and turn on worship mind. That's hard to do. And a lot of times we don't have that preparation of mind and heart like we ought to. But you look at this pattern for these priests to be consecrated, that took eight days. There was thought, there was preparation, there was process that went into it. And we have to, we can't just think that we can just walk in and do it off the cuff like that. It doesn't work that way. Look at Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 20 and verses 7 and 8. There it says, Consecrate yourself, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Another question. Does God play a role in sanctifying these priests? Did he play a role in sanctifying these priests? Yes or no? Yes. Do you think God plays a role in sanctifying us and consecrating us? Of course he does. Of course he does. Look at Joshua chapter 3 and verse 5. He says, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Did those priests have anything to do with their consecration? Of course they did. Must we have something to do with our consecration and sanctification? Yes, we must. This is not optional. For us to offer worship to God, we must be sanctified for that purpose. We must be set aside for that purpose, consecrated for that. We play a role in that, and God plays a role in that. Look at Jeremiah chapter 29. Oh, I'm way behind on my slides. Click, click, click. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Effort matters, right? Effort matters. And when I asked if we play a role in our consecration, and I want to spend just a couple minutes looking at Romans chapter 8, but I'm going to look at more than just verse 5. So if you would, turn to Romans chapter 8. Here's my first semi-controversial thing I'm going to say. This should not be controversial, but it, it might be. I am not going to tiptoe around the idea of indwelling of the Spirit because of what we're going to read in Romans chapter 8. Okay? Do we need to have a clear understanding of what that means in Scripture? Yes. But is it scriptural? 100%. Look at Romans chapter 8 and begin in verse 5 with me. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. I'm going to pause for effect. The mind that is set on flesh cannot Please God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. 
If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit and dwells in you. I have heard Christians say they don't believe in indwelling of the spirit. That is to say, I've heard people say, Christians say, they don't believe in Romans chapter 8. Because to me, that's plain as day. Now, I don't believe, nor do I have ever seen any evidence of, that meaning that we have spiritual gifts like we see described in 1 Corinthians. That's not what we're talking about. But what Paul will tell you in Romans chapter 8 is if you don't have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, then don't expect resurrection. Because that's the Spirit that dwells in you if you're a Christian. That spirit of resurrection. That spirit of life. And that spirit that God gives, it, gives to you plays a role in making you specifically equipped to worship God. Look back at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, hopefully that's us, set their minds on the things of the spirit. The people of the flesh cannot please God. You can. Christian. That means something. That's important. Okay. Woo. I'm not going to have time to go through questions, but we're going to try. What can be done to eliminate or mitigate, if you can't eliminate them, distractions in worship? And let's define this. What do we mean? What, do we mean? what distracts us in worship? <laughs> Let the record stay. <laughs> that was Carrie Carr and not me. Do children distract us in worship? Yeah, sometimes. Um, but, and I, and I know some of you have felt this, sit in a congregation without them. That silence is distracting. If you sit in a congregation without children, you'll miss it. That's a dying church. That's a dying church and I've sat in those churches, and it's sad. And I know Carrie was joking, that's why I go ahead and say this. <laughs> Although... Half joking, right? <laughs> right. What other things distract us in worship? Our phones. Our phones distract us in worship, but we put it on silence. All it does is vibrate. It doesn't really distract us, right? It does. Dwight, what were you going to say, sir? I try to turn back to John 17. Yes. I think Jesus was probably in tears when he was telling his father, please let this cup pass from me. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of desire we need when we're saying a prayer. It's got to be not earthly, right. but it's got to be heavenly and yeah. acceptable to him. Yeah, we're heavenly beings. Um, hard for us to think that way because we don't feel very heavenly. You know, I feel about 248. Um, that doesn't seem like a heavenly body, but that's what God has made us. We are spiritual beings. Um, Speaking of 248, other things that distract us in, in worship, what are we going to eat for lunch? Is Mike going to wrap this up so I can beat all the Baptists to, you know, whatever restaurant I'm going to? Um, and sometimes it's more legitimate things, right? Sometimes we have financial pressures or someone we know and love is sick um, or we've lost somebody. And those are, hard, those are real distractions, okay? Those are real things. And the point is, you know, some are frivolous, some are not. They're all distractions. Um, what can we do to mitigate those things? Remember what we're doing. Remember whose presence we're coming into. And remember where we're going. Resurrection is our end as Christians, and we need to keep that in mind. If we keep focusing on the end, then sometimes the noise of right now can dissipate a little bit. We didn't get through all the questions, but you were all great. Thank you for the comments, and we'll do it again on Wednesday, Lesson 1.4. Thank you.